Trump administration discussed a coup with rebel Venezuelan officers. American officials are telling the Times that the administration indeed held secret meetings with rebellious military officers to discuss plans to overthrow President Nicolas Maduro. Join this troika of tyranny, this triangle of terror stretching from Havana to Caracas to Managua is the cause of immense human suffering. Under President Trump, the United States is taking direct action against all three regimes to defend the rule of law, liberty, and basic human decency in our region. In 2018, we live in a 24-hour news cycle inundated with stories from across the globe. But when you think about stories of migration, starvation, and violation of human rights, what countries come to mind? Syria? Yemen? Myanmar? What about Venezuela? Venezuela may not be the first country that comes to mind when you think about a country in turmoil with thousands of people leaving each day. But why is that? Even a simple Google search only containing the word Venezuela results in a few articles from major news outlets, such as the Washington Post. But even those results are sporadic in terms of how often major news outlets cover the crisis. Arguably, the crisis in Venezuela began after the price of its biggest export, oil, dropped severely in 2014 coinciding with the election of Nicolas Maduro, leaving the economy in shambles and pushing inflation through the roof, making even the most basic items extremely unaffordable to the general population. Other issues, such as the elections of legislators, Maduro's Supreme Court appointments, and the ending of presidential term limits contributed to the protests that began in 2016. The country is currently facing high levels of hyperinflation. On average, prices double every 26 days, and one U.S. dollar equals 248,000 Venezuelan bolivars. There's an economic war with black markets and hoarding from pro-opposition businessmen and speculation. There are food shortages, with 27.6% of children at risk of malnutrition, and 15.7% of children suffer from mild to acute malnutrition. There has been a large drop in oil output, which produces 95% of government revenue. It's a humanitarian crisis. People cannot afford food or medicine because inflation is 800,000%. And then the currency has changed three times this year. So there's just like an economical, social, and political crisis. Um, well, we have the government, which is, and then we have the opposition. Um, however, the opposition is split in like three different groups. So right now it's very divided. And that's why the government still is in power because there's uh, not a very strong opposition. Um, and the leaders are all fighting and no one knows how to help the country really. Okay. Is that he didn't bring it from college? Um, he, when he became president, I work at the elections where he won, and he actually won the first time he was elected. People say that he didn't win, but um, all the numbers are right. Um, and then the elections after that, people haven't been voting, and he has been bringing people from other countries to vote for him. Um, and now the pe less people are liking him when he started um, he had 80% of when people like someone. How do you say that? Um, oh. Approval. 80% oh. of approval. While right now it it's around between 15 and 20% of approval. Um, however, he's still in power since he has the money and he has all the military with him. So the management of the money even though the oil prices when Maduro started were very very high um they didn't know how to manage the money and there's so much corruption in the country which has affected obviously the economy um because the majority of the country is getting poor and poor however like the government's getting richer and richer so there's a big gap between the poor and the rich. Um, people have to wait in line for like an average of like five to eight hours to get food. Um, and then you're not allowed to, um, to get more than like, every item is different. So like you're not allowed to get more than like four toilet papers per family member. Um, so, and then sometimes you wait in line for eight hours and when you get inside the supermarket, like 
all the food that you needed is gone because there's not enough food for the whole country. When I worked in the elections, uh, I was in charge of contacting individuals in different schools to make sure that everything everything was running smoothly, and if this and if they had any problems, they could get, they could contact me, so I could contact my supervisor, and then to get um, things done. I think the biggest problem is that the schools that I got were in the middle of nowhere in the country, so communication was really bad, and those places are the ones that are. Um, the more most skeptical ones since the government have the most power in those places so they can have people vote twice or they can have closed the uh, um, election polls earlier so more people don't vote depending on what they want so that those were very critical but it was very hard to communicate with the people there because um, where they were mm -hmm. um, Enrique Maduro was running against Maduro at that time, mm -hmm. and the opposition was pretty, like, a, it was a strong unit. So, and then, so it was only two parties, it was the oppositions against the government mm -hmm. right now. Um, and it was, the majority of, of us were between the age of 15 and like 24, so that was really good. Um, you just got to hang out with people and like learn a lot about like other individuals with, in, within the country, because we all came from different parts of the country, so that was nice. So since I think it was my junior year of high school, that was where the protests started. And um, since I was in high school, obviously my school, the government decided that any school who closes the door so their, kid, their students could go to the protest, they would have closed the school forever. So every school had to keep open. And I remember going to school and out of like 800 students only, like a hundred went to school for two months. Um, the rest of us were either um, helping out at the protest, not even not just protesting, but like giving water, food, or <laughs> people just decided to stop going to school. Has a it was showing like they were within with the pro protest, meaning like you don't have to be in the protest to be protesting. And then I experienced that for two years, and then I went home. A year ago, where um, I think one of our biggest protests happened, it was, um, I think it was two months, and I actually went to the protest this time, and I saw people were just angry and desperate because they couldn't find what they needed to survive. Like, they couldn't find food, they couldn't find medicine, so they decided, like, might as well, like, I'd rather just fight for my country, and, and like, if I get, get killed or if, I, if something happens to me, like, at least I've been fighting for my country. So that was kind of the message. But then that stopped and there's little protests every day because people are complaining about not having water, not having electricity. So 